we'll go ahead and get started for today. So this is our middle main walking tour and we're going to go ahead and start here from the museum and we'll walk down and we'll take a look at a lot of the buildings on Main Street and then we'll take some uh, little sojourns off to look at some of the other buildings. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out today. Uh, the purpose of the museum is to collect and store the history of Clark County, but another part of our mission is also to interpret that history. And that's what these tours are all about, is that we look through our research archives and we find the history uh, that we can collect of these buildings to be able to tell the story of the physical places and the legacy that's left in this community around here. So we'll start here first with this building. This was originally uh, the Carnegie Library. It was a 1909 Carnegie Library, and it was built with a $10,000 grant from Carnegie. And uh, Edgar Swan and W. Foster Hidden were actually two of the major uh, individuals that spearheaded getting this grant. And Hidden was actually a part of the prominent Hidden uh, Family Brick Company. And their operation was actually across the street here, and it encompassed this lot from 16th all the way down to 13th, which we'll see L.M. Hidden's house at the foot of uh, that. And that was the whole property and they had a brick operation. And then other times there was a sawmill and other things and houses over on this property. So the Hiddens were uh, quite helpful in this process. L.M. actually donated this plot of land right here that uh, the, the library was built on because part of the stipulation for the grant was that the money was only to go to the construction of the building and nothing else. So the land had to be already purchased, the books, the staffing, all the furnishings, everything had to be provided by the community and it was only for the building that Carnegie provided the money. And so Hidden actually donated this plot of land which used to be a clay pit. And so they had to fill in a little bit, but not too much because we have a basement. And the hidden stipulation was is that a, a library must always remain on the premises or the land is to revert back to the family. And so in honor of that, we have our research library downstairs. So since 1909, there has been continuously a library in this building uh, the entire time. And uh, there's rumors about this building. So when this was first built, it was one of the first public buildings with electricity. And it was rumored that the librarians were kind of nervous about this electricity thing. It was somewhat new. Um, it was only maybe, you know, uh, 20, 30 years people had been working with this thing really seriously. And so they actually had gas lamps installed and ran those for the lighting instead of electricity when the building was first built. And so when this was finally completed, the community donated about $1,300 for books. And by the 1960s, this building was holding about 125,000 books, and it was five times more than it had been designed to hold. And so the Clark County, or the Fort Vancouver Historical Society at that time, came in and took this over as a museum, and the library moved to what is now the administrative buildings for the library on Mill Plain. And this building just has a great legacy in the community. From here, we're gonna go and walk down, and we'll take a look at L.M. Hidden's house. So this property used to span all the way across, and from their accounts until about the 1960s, this space right here would have actually been blocked off and there wouldn't have been a throughway here. And if you look over here, you'll see an old sign for the Palace Market still hangs up in the window here at the Brick House restaurant. Sure. So if everyone wants to take a look back here with this corner over here, across the street, this is L.M. Hidden's house. I'll wait for the truck to pass real quick. And this house was built in 1884. Now, Hidden actually started his brick company in 1871, and this property that he had it stretched all the way down, like I said, um, in that original time. And for the first several years, he actually lived on a log cabin on this property uh, here until he had this house built uh, in 1884. And this is a Queen Anne style home. And Hidden uh, came to the community and began to get land and to do a lot of different things, and he was quite an industrialist. And after some time, his son uh, W. Foster Hidden actually took over the operation and uh, ran the brickyard for many years. And in about 1929, he took the brickyard operation and he moved it up to Fourth Plain and Kaufman, where the final Hidden Brickyard is at. And the reason for that is from where the museum's at, there ran a vein of clay diagonal across uh, Vancouver up to that fourth plane site. And so it was a perfect site for brick manufacturing. And 
at the time when they moved up there, they were still using somewhat older technology and they used what was called an updraft kiln at that fourth plane site and it would heat the brick from below with a draft from the fire and then eventually in the 60s they installed what was called a updraft or a downdraft kiln where they would have heat coming from down and it was a technological advance of the time and at that time in the 60s Robert Arthur Hidden actually took over the family business and Hidden uh, Robert was quite significant uh, to Vancouver the Vancouver Historical Society because he helped preserve this house he helped save Providence Academy. He fought very hard to save the auditorium for the Fort Vancouver uh, High School. And he also helped save the uh, Covington Log Cabin. So the Hidden family has really done a lot for the history of this community to maintain that. And this is the house of the family patriarch, LM. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful home. From here, we'll head down and we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna take a look at the Medical Arts Building and we get a look uh, from up top, the city of Vancouver. So while we're waiting for Ken real quick, I'll talk about this building, just kind of give you a little baseline on it. So this building was built in 1928, and this was the earliest and largest building built by prominent uh, architect Day Hilborn. And Hilborn was quite prolific in the area. He did a lot of designs, and if you turn, and we'll be walking down just a little while to this, if you look over there, the Kiggin Cedar was also designed by Hilborn. So Hilborn came up as an architect during a time when there was a transition. This was a Beaux-Arts style of architecture, and this was uh, you know, famously used in the Chicago Exposition of uh, 1893, I believe. And so Hilborn, becoming an architect in the 1920s, was at the tail end of this style being used and moving into the modern and Art Deco style, which we see over there. And then if you look at the Clark County Courthouse, that one, that's also a Hillborn design, and that's towards the end of his career. And that one is a purely modern style. So you actually see the evolution of Day Hillborn moving uh, his architecture from one place to another. But originally, this was the medical arts building. You would have had doctor's offices in here. And then at a the time, some people have recalled um, remembering that Hadley's, it was a, uh, it was a store, a uh, clothing store, would have been in the lower section of the building here. 1928. And that one was 30? Yeah, 36. And then uh, the courthouse is 41. So from here, we'll head in and we'll take the elevator up to uh, the top of the building. So the elevator goes to the last, like second to last floor, and then you have to go up a set of stairs for the last bit. It would be the very top floor on the elevator, and then you'll walk up uh, stairs for the last bit that used to be in the basement of this building in the 30s. It was called the Pitt Cafe. And, uh, and there, obviously the name is uh, because it was in the pit of the building. And it had its own outside entrance, which you can see where it was on the south side of the building. In the 30s, uh, after Prohibition, the brewery got going again. And all the workers were represented by the Brewery Workers Union. And the Central Labor Council and all the, most of the union offices in Vancouver were in the basement of this building. And uh, so there was a battle going on between the Teamsters in Portland and the brewery workers in Vancouver who would have jurisdiction over uh, the workers at the brewery. And the AFL-CIO said it belongs to the Teamsters. Well, because the brewery workers were not affiliated with the AFL-CIO. Eventually, the brewery workers and the Teamsters joined together. It wasn't until 1973 where they joined together across the country. but. One day, several Teamster uh, folks came over from Portland, and they were going to confront the uh, president of the Labor Council here. He also happened to own the Pitt Cafe. So they came in, and they had quite a, quite a ruckus. And the newspapers called it the Pitt Cafe Riot. <laughs> and that battle continued on for many years. But anyway, so that's what was important about this basement of this building. But I'll point out a few other labor temples that have been around Vancouver starting in 1918 and they moved to different buildings. They were here primarily in, in the 30s. Uh, and then we'll see another building that was built in 46. It actually has a plaque and there were 13 union offices in that building uh, clear up until the late 70s. But anyway, we'll go on up to the roof and again it'll be pretty much single file because we're going to go through Tammy's office. Just a quick story about this uh, building. This, the story goes, this penthouse was added years later after this building was up. It was standing by itself 
not by itself, it was standing, had a small penthouse for the elevators, which most commercial buildings do. But the, the people across the street, as the story goes, they built a building that blocked the view from here looking east. So in retaliation, this is how the story goes, in retaliation, the owner of this building built this whole penthouse to block that building's view of the west. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any truth to it, but it, it makes uh, for a good story. Some of the labor temples I was talking about, the first labor temple in Vancouver was at the corner of 9th and Washington. It's called the Rank Building. And I talked to the owner of that building, who also owns this building. He didn't, even, he didn't know that that was the name of that building, but that was uh, Glenn Rank, who named many of the streets on the west side of Vancouver. He was a well-known politician and business leader here in Vancouver. Uh, he built that building. In 1918, he sold it to the Central Labor Council, and uh, so they were there for many years, and, and until the Great Depression, uh, most of the labor unions at the time folded here in Vancouver. Later, they ended up here. We're going to see another building where they were at. And uh, you can also see some of the other buildings that Brad's going to talk about. Kiggins Theater, he talked a little bit about that. Uh, many of you probably remember J.C. Penney's. It's now called the Evergreen Building. But J.C. Penney's was that glass enclosed building there in the corner. And right next to it in that parking lot was the Broadway Theater. And the Broadway Theater was operational clear until the late 80s. There was a number of theaters here in town. Uh, no, excuse me, that was the Castle Theater. A block, two blocks down was the, was the Broadway Theater at 839 Broadway. And so we had a number of, of uh, businesses that uh, are no longer around. Flynn's Furniture was at that building. And if you went on the Hauk tour, you saw the Flynn house. But uh, that was at the same location as the Evergreen Building. When they built this building, it's called the Medical Arts Building, but it just says Arts Building on it. It was mostly doctor's offices that were occupying this building, clear up until the time they built the Vancouver Clinic up on 39th Street, and many of the doctors moved up there or moved into smaller clinics around town. And of course, the Vancouver Clinic has grown from there, and now they have three locations, the biggest one on 87th Street. But it all started with the folks that were here. And we'll go and head down, and we're going to walk across the street, and we'll take a look at the Kiggins Theater. Hey, Brad, the question came up, uh, where was the hospital at the doctor's offices that were here? And I, and I talked about St. Joseph's Hospital was over on 12th Street in approximately the same location as that Comfort Inn. Yeah. But uh, in 1929, uh, the medical community got together and built a hospital at 33rd and Main. It was called Clark General Hospital and uh, later became, at the end of World War II, they changed the name to Vancouver Memorial Hospital. It's still part of a medical complex. Next week, that's where our tour starts. Yep. So this is the historic Kiggins Theater. The theater was built in 1936. And uh, how many people here have actually went to a movie in this theater? Quite a few, right? So a lot of people in the community know the theater, but they actually don't know the person behind the theater. The person who built this theater was John P. Kiggins, and he was a nine-time mayor of Vancouver, uh, not consecutively, but over a 30-year span. And Kiggins was a lover of the entertainment industry. He had this theater built, and he also had just a block down, the Castle Theater built, and so that people could come and enjoy films in the Vancouver area. Kiggins was a transplant from the East Coast, and he came here through military service, and after his discharge, he began, uh, to, he came out to the city and began a business, and he was a, a construction business owner. And so Kiggins, you know, was in on constructing a lot of uh, businesses. This building here was designed by Day Hillborn for Kiggins, and it's said that the structure, the whole structure on the outside took about 500 truckloads of concrete to complete. And this building is an Art Deco style building uh, that he had constructed. And Kiggins was actually, since we talked about labor in that other building, Kiggins was a, was a great supporter of labor in the community. He actually held fundraisers for the wives and children of striking workers uh, in the early 20th century to help uh, feed their children and their wives during a strike. And when that building was turned into a labor temple, he actually put in the labor newspaper, in the community labor newspaper, congratulations on your new temple. So he was quite involved. And Ken actually has a story about that too. Yeah. In, uh, in the early 30s, 
SPNS, Spokane, Portland, and Seattle, or Seattle, Portland, Spokane Railway, they owned much of the port property. And a company came in and wanted to build a grain elevator. It was now a deep water port. I believe it was 1933. Well, when they were planning this, Kiggins went to SPNS and implored them, begged them to use union labor from Vancouver to build that rather than importing workers from across the river in Portland unless they couldn't find the skill set. And, and as a result, they did. And there was a great relationship between organized labor and John Kiggins. Although Kiggins didn't have great relationships between every group in the community, his break in being mayor, he was actually defeated in an election, and it was because of, his, um, because of the dislikes of Kiggins uh, by the temperance unions in the area. The temperance unions were the individuals who were trying to have prohibition and liquor laws in the community, and Kiggins was not a favorite of that community, and so they actually ran uh, a politician against him and defeated him in an election, um, but he eventually uh, you know, got his feet back underneath him and became mayor once again. And the last thing I'll say about this building is, is that recently this building has been taken over um, and, uh, by Dan Wyatt, uh, and he has been doing an amazing job. He's uh, redone the inside of the building and the seats, uh, maintained the theater, and has been just uh, continuously doing really great things for the community out here. And right now they're doing what's called a Kickstarter program. So as you walk by, if you want to see that, they're trying to upgrade to a digital projector. Um, and the reason this is important is because all of the films will be digital next year. So if you don't have a digital projector, you can no longer show new films. And Dan has done such a great job maintaining this historic site. Uh, all of us in the historic community definitely don't want to see him go out of business and have this building at threat once again, uh, as it had been before. And there's live music, Coop Fest tonight. So you mentioned this theater and the other ones that were all movie theaters. Yeah. Were there uh, plays? There were in the earlier days. And it's harder to tell of which ones like for sure, because they transitioned at times too. They'd be play theaters and then they would be movie theaters eventually. Yeah. This one was This is a movie theater. And this actually is not the original marquee. The original, this is a later marquee. The original marquee was an Art Deco black marquee uh, and it came straight out and it turned and it had the Kiggins going from the center of it. And actually uh, we posted just a couple days ago on our Facebook a picture of that marquee. So if you're interested in actually seeing a photo of that, um, then you can, uh, you can look at that uh, on our Facebook page. And also, uh, if you want, like us on Facebook. We're trying to get 5,000 by the end of the month on our page. So, Keep <laughs> yeah. sharing it. so real quick, uh, so we've gotten several questions as we've been walking. Uh, and Ken and I, we've been so steeped in labor history because we've worked on the labor history exhibit that we forget to explain certain things sometimes. So the, the medical arts building was a labor temple. And everyone's pretty familiar with the term labor hall, right? Labor temples were places that there were multiple unions occupying the same building. And so it was just, a, it was just an amalgamation of different uh, labor unions. And a lot of time, they would either be AFL, which uh, used to be separate from the CIO. So they'd be AFL or CIO unions in those different places. And then the labor hall was just the singular place for one labor union. So that, in case you, that question was burning, there's the answer to that. But here... We see this building right here. This is, a, this is a 1928 building. And this was the site of the Columbian before they moved into the offices that they now occupy on uh, the street down there. I think it's 8th, possibly. Um, and so when you'd walk down in 28, you would see a sign on the side of this that went down and it said Columbian. And this building was first built when Herbert Campbell took over the business. And Campbell is actually uh, the first descendant of the Campbell family that still owns the Columbian today. And this was one of the first sites in uh, Vancouver that was built specifically to manufacture a newspaper. The rest of the places had been kind of set up in shops or different buildings, but not specifically built for the purpose of, of making a newspaper. And this was one of those. And Campbell has left a great legacy in the Columbian. Um, back in the early 20th century and late 19th century, the newspapers were politically driven. If that's a surprise to anyone, 
they were Democrat or Republican, and they would, they would outright argue to each other through columns. They would say that, that Democratic rag of the independent or that you know, raucous Republican paper, and they would, they would fight back and forth. Well, Campbell, when he came in, he actually took a neutral editorial stance, which was kind of strange for the day, but it was a trend that was changing in journalism where they wanted to be more editorial based. And so he ushered that in, even though he had political leanings to one way or another, he decided to be more neutral in his case. So from here, we're gonna cross the street, we'll take a look at the Sparks building, and then we'll take a look at Providence Academy. This building was built in 1951 to replace this building down on 7th Street, uh, where the Eagles Lodge is right now. That was uh, originally built in 1912 as a furniture store. But Sparks was originally in the Vancouver area doing business as early as 1882. Uh, Sparks is the oldest family-owned business still in operation today. Now, Steve Runyon will take exception with that because he'll say, no, theirs may be the oldest business, but ours is the oldest business where we, uh, where we work with the same product that we started with, i.e. jewelry. Sparks started out as a, as a hardware store and tinsmith down on Lower Main. And that's, you can no longer get a trough for your horse at Sparks, and that's <laughs> one of those things they would say. So this is the House of Providence, as it says up top, built in 1873. And this is one of the major uh, buildings that helped the Hidden family, among other things, get off the ground. Uh, Lowell L.M. Hidden started the brick uh, company in 1871, and he provided the bricks for this site right here. Now, the House of Providence knows it as the Academy, and it's one of the most significant uh, pieces of architecture in the Northwest. Um, and it was built uh, for Mother Joseph and the Sisters of uh, Providence. And it was originally served as a boarding school, an orphanage, and the headquarters for the sisters. And they would have, uh, throughout the year, they would have charitable events at different halls and places around the city to raise funds for the orphans and for the different people. Now, a short history of Mother Joseph tells of a 30-year-old French-Canadian uh, nun and a group of four missionary sisters that came to Fort Vancouver in 1856. The Hudson's Bay Company, a Canadian, uh, Canadian fur trading company, had founded the fort uh, just 28 years earlier uh, and asked the sisters to come out. Unfortunately, when they asked them to come out, there had been no preparations made, and so the sisters were kind of uh, left to figure things out. But if they were in dismay, no one could tell because they quickly set to work and they first remodeled the first stor uh, storage building at the fort residence, and soon they received uh, their first orphan and others quickly uh, followed. And within seven short years, uh, the Providence suburb uh, occupied seven buildings, um, the day and boarding schools, the hospital, the asylum, the home for the aged and orphaned, and many others. Um, and eventually they grew out of this space and they needed another place. And at the same time, the US military was taking over the fort area and so they were asking a lot of people to evacuate the, the, the area. So they had this building built. And this is an amazing legacy of Mother Joseph and the Hidden Family. And the Hidden Family has owned this building for quite some time. Uh, and they're uh, currently, it's in a uh, sale process. But Robert Hidden, this building was going to be torn down. And Robert Hidden came to the aid of the community and helped save this building. He also tried to save the St. Joseph's Hospital, like I said, in the auditorium. But he was able to save this amazing landmark of Clark County history right here. So from here, we're gonna walk around and you can take a look at the building. Feel free to take photos. Um, this building over here on the maps is labeled as the kindergarten, Yep. right? Yep. And then the back building were some more door, uh, what was it? It was dorms, dorms. And, and the boiler, and, and the, the boiler, boiler house. Room. So you see that. What is it? That, that, that's the, the boilers were uh, in a building. Uh, this is what you the house? Yeah, yeah. Steam pipes ran under under the ground ah, to, right. to to heat the building. Okay. What's the most risk? Um, in uh, the Wallace School in Northwest Portland, um, every year there's heat loss of Catch up real quick, and I'll just talk about this building. This building was built in 1961, and it was designed by architect Day Hilborn. And one of the funny things about this, if you've been on previous tours, you probably heard this. One of the funny things about this is the newspapers when this building was built and finally shown, they uh, referred to it as, as modern as a rocket to the moon. 
and that's because of this modern Art Deco style that they have right here. But this is, uh, was originally the Vancouver Savings and Loan, which actually started in the early 20th century and was uh, quite significant in the community for some time. What year did this? 1961 when this was built. So if everyone wants to keep heading, and we'll go all the way down to Mill Plain and then we'll turn. So I'll let you uh, start heading down that way. Pretty modern. If you see that little shack over there, the Muchos Gracias, yeah. that building was also designed by Day Hilborn. And it was one of his places he liked to go. It used to be the Spick and Span drive through and he would eat a burger while he was there. And he, it's, it's rumored that he used to sit there and he would eat a burger and he would sketch out drawings and he'd just be going, you know, doing that all the time. And he was known in the community by name, but not necessarily by face. And so one story a local citizen has told is that uh, someone came up to him one day and saw him sketching and eating and said, who do you think you are? Day Hillborn? <laughs> so Hillborn turns and looks at him, nice man in the community, and he said, why, yes, I am. And so Hillborn, it's, it's, uh, it's said that that was one of his favorite buildings that he ever designed, was that little burger shack right there. <laughs>